uh, about what to do next, what do we mm -hmm. do from sort of psychotic genetics. And I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Good. Thank you, Varun. And thank you for the invitation to speak here today. And hello, Graham. <laughs> um, so I was told that this is an audience that'd be interested in genetics but isn't really a genetics audience. And so that's the way I've uh, pitched the talk today. So to give an overview. So first of all, why study genetics? Why study psychiatric genetics? So this is like the, the basic starting point, this observation from epidemiological data. But here you can see the grey bars are the risk of uh, having, a, have one of these, having one of these disorders in the population. So you know, what's the risk of your next door neighbour having one of these disorders? That's the grey bars. And then the blue bars are the risk of having the disorder if your dad has got the disorder or a first degree relative. So you can see there's a massive increased risk and those red numbers show the risk ratios. So that's one way to show there's a genetic contribution to disorders. You could say, well, maybe there's, um, you know, is it nature or nurture? But the, there's enough ways that we can do analyses of the data to say that the contribution to this increased risk is very, very much mostly genetic factors. But it's actually quite hard to compare. Well, I've got those disorders there side by side. It's actually quite hard from those risk ratios to say which disorders have got a higher genetic contribution than others. And so then we do some um, kind of analyses and transformations, and usually we use this term heritability, which is the proportion of variation attributable to genetic factors. And so with those sorts of analyses, we can see that schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and ADHD and autism are, have a high proportion of that liability attributable to genetic factors and less so for major depression, uh, anorexia. But still, all of them have a high genetic contribution. And in fact, genetic risk factors for all these disorders are higher than other risk factors. And so going forward from this, it makes sense to try and understand the genetic contribution, because if, if there is a genetic contribution, it's actually pointing to causality. Because almost anything else that you might measure in people with a disorder, it's really hard to know, is it cause or consequence? But if we can get to the genetic factors, which are being passed from parent to offspring, then that's, that's helping us look at causality. So for a long time, there was a kind of debate about the genetic contribution to psychiatric disorders. And it was actually back in 1973 that Irv Gottesman and James Shields said that maybe schizophrenia has a polygenic architecture, so represented by many, many genetic variants. But um, it was really hard from observational data to confirm that suggestion. So in 1990 and 1995, for example, those are examples where people were taking observational data and trying to make different genetic models, looking at uh, a single risk factor or two risk factors or multiple risk factors. And I think you could exclude one risk factor. But from observational data, it was really hard to say whether it could be you know, two risk factors, three, or polygenic. And so in 2007, there was this massive debate in the field. And here, actually, it, it used to go on at the conferences, but here it was actually put down in writing with um, Mary Claire King, who's well known for her work in breast cancer, saying that schizophrenia was underpinned by multiple rare alleles and each, each family essentially had different rare alleles. Whereas the team in Cardiff, well known for their gen psychiatric genetics uh, work, uh, said no, it's much more likely to be polygenic. But at that point, we didn't have empirical eviden evidence to um, solve those two opinions. And so really in the last 15 years, things have really been transformed. And they've been transformed firstly because of the clinical observations here, with that, represented by that picture, by the technological advances, so the way in which we can measure variants in DNA, <coughs> by our ability to do computational analyses, and also methodology. And so I suppose my talk now is about what's happened in the last 15 years what have we learned, and in my viewpoint, what to do next. And I suppose I, I focus myself in this kind of mathsy methods realm, but my choice of application is in psychiatric disorders. I work on many complex common disorders, but my interest is working in psychiatric disorders. So this represents the results of genetic studies for schizophrenia as we stand at the moment. This, these two papers were published side by side in Nature last year. And so on the left-hand side was the latest genome-wide association study. So on the x-axis, position on the chromosome, y-axis, strength of association. All those green towers are showing sites of association. And we actually have now 342 independent loci associated with schizophrenia. So now we have direct empirical evidence that these disorders are polygenic. Uh, 
And the right hand side, uh, and the reason that we've got the green towers, that's representing the correlation structure in the genome, that the genome, little uh, sections of the genome are correlated, so you have many DNA variants which show the association. And on the right hand side is a result of um, whole exome sequencing studies, which are more designed to find variants of larger effects. So you can see on the x axis frequency in the population and the y axis strength of association. So rare variants that we can identify have got larger effects. There will be many rare variants with small effect, we just can't identify them. But rare variants, uh, variants with large effect are much more likely to have a low frequency because variants of large effect are under strong selection. And so over time, rare variants get, um, have less chance of being passed on to the next generation. So we can represent, so these slides kind of represent the kind of technologies that we've used for genetic studies, sequencing versus this array technology, which is very cheap to do these genome-wide association studies. And in the next slide, I'm going to use these colours, brown and green. So the green represents the contribution from uh, the common variants from the genome-wide association studies, and the brown represents variants from these whole exome sequencing studies. So this is like the summary of genetic studies for psychiatric disorders from the last 15 years. The paper was published in 2016, but it hasn't really changed. We have um, this pattern, so where the green bars represent the proportion of variation that we think we can attribute to common genetic factors identified um, that variation is identified through genome-wide association studies. We haven't yet identified all the individual variants that contribute to that green bar, but we can see that signal. And the brown bars represent the um, variation that um, is rare in the population, so more identified through exome sequencing studies, and also the purple. And you can see on the y-axis the disorders, which are ordered from um, early childhood where severe intellectual disability is likely to be diagnosed through later childhood autism and ADHD and then on to the adult onset disorders. And what you can see there is that there's more, the brown bars feature more for those childhood onset disorders, whereas the green bars are more relevant for the adult onset disorders. So that means this polygenic component is more relevant for the adult onset disorders, which I tend to work on, whereas these rarer variants of larger effect um, are meaning that children will be... If you carry a variant of large effect, it's a bit like our diagnostic system. You've got that variant of large effect, it's got a large effect, you're more likely to present to a clinic early in childhood and get one of these earlier diagnoses of intellectual disability. Um, and on the left-hand side is where we are with um, uh, discovery of individual variants. We've got 342 for schizophrenia, 600 now for depression. Actually, I think I just heard that's gone up to 700. 64 for bipolar disorder. So having ma made these discoveries, what do you do with them? And so, um, you know, many variants of large effect, really polygenic, the effect sizes are very small. How do you take those results forward? So before uh, thinking about those pathways forward, I just want to think more about what it mean to be, what polygenic means. I showed with that um, genome-wide association plot, that's one way to visualise polygenicity, that there's these variants all across the genome. But what does it actually mean for an individual? So to try and help visualise that, what I've done here is I've taken the 342 independent SNPs that have been identified in the paper published last year, and now I've gone to the UK Biobank, where there's actually not that many people with schizophrenia, but there are some people with schizophrenia diagnosed. And so for each individual in the UK Biobank, I've just counted up the number of risk alleles they have for those 342 uh, independent SNPs. So, for example, you can ha have, on the right-hand side, I'm showing a SNP where there's a C and a T allele, and I'm saying that if the T is the risk allele, I'm counting zero for someone that's homozygous CC, one if they're uh, heterozygous CT, and two, if they're homozygous TT, where they're carrying two risk alleles. And so this is like a genomic profile for an individual where it's grey if someone's got zero risk alleles at one of the SNPs, blue, one risk allele, and, and two, uh, and orange if they've got two risk alleles. And here I've got two people who don't have schizophrenia who've got um, low risk allele counts. And on the right-hand side, two people with schizophrenia who've got high risk allele counts. And so what this visualisation is doing is showing that every single one of us is carrying these 
risk variants for schizophrenia. In fact, we're all carrying risk variants for every common disease and disorder, which are all polygenic. It's just that those people who are at high risk for a disorder have, by chance, a high burden of these risk variants. And as you can see, each person is likely to carry a unique combination. And so then the question is, if everybody has a different combination of these risk variants, you know, how is it, what is the, how do they converge onto the same biology to end up with the same diagnosis? So one pathway forward is to integrate the results from our genome-wide association studies between data sets. So here I've got a genome-wide association study, cases versus controls, where we've identified risk alleles in the, which are more common in the risk allele in the cases and in the controls. And so those associations map to the DNA through those SNP associations. And then we can take another genome-wide association study, completely independently co collected, also cases and controls, also identify the SNP associations. And because they're mapped onto the DNA, we have a backbone to put those data sets together. And that means that we've been able to look at the relationship between different disorders, the genetic relationship, which in fact is really, really hard to do from observational data. Because if you wanted to know, is schizophrenia genetically related to bipolar disorder, you'd have to collect a data set where you've got people with schizophrenia and then look at the proportion of their children that go on to have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So you actually, because both of those disorders are only like 1% in the population, you actually need massive data sets to do that. So they have done that, for example, the Swedish registries, but other than that, it's, it's quite hard to do. So this is one of the studies I led uh, back in 2013. First of all, the methodology about how to bring together genome-wide association studies from different disorders um, and, and the, the methodology for, for making these estimates, essentially, of genetic correlations between disorders. And so in this work, we made the first estimates of genetic correlations from genome-wide association studies, estimating the genetic correlation between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder to be 0.6, between bipolar disorder and major depression to be 0.5, and between schizophrenia and major depression to be 0.3. And my co-last author was Ken Kendler, who many of you will know is a very, very big name in the field, has the biggest H index of anyone I know. And he was surprised at that point that we, there was a genetic relationship between schizophrenia and major depression because in his work, and he was like the leader in this, this field, from observational data, it's really hard to see an increased risk in schizophrenia in family members of those with depression because depression is so common. But nowadays, you know, just 10 years on, everyone very much accepts the genetic relationship between these disorders because of these sorts of studies. And in this very first paper, one of the things I was concerned about was, well, how do I actually interpret those correlations? Um, and so we did additional analyses where we split up the data sets from schizophrenia. So we had two data sets, genome-wide association studies for schizophrenia, and said, if you've got two data sets from schizophrenia, what's the genetic correlation between them? Because we'd assume it's one. Um, but in fact, the estimate was 0.8. And we took two data sets from bipolar disorder, made estimates, and there the genetic correlation was 0.7. And two data sets of major depression, the genetic correlation between those was 0.6. So, what, so that then helps us benchmark the estimates between disorders. If it's only 0.6 between major, de major depression and major depression, well, you wouldn't expect it to be uh, any higher than that between major depression and another disorder. But it's also telling us something about our phenotypes, that maybe the way in which we di diagnose schizophrenia, people say it's, it's schizophrenia itself is still a heterogeneous, but something... But the bio biologically, um, the data sets were more similar than the data sets we collect for major depression where uh, the heterogeneity in that diagnosis is going to contribute to, to our genetic findings. Um, what do I say next? Okay, here. Um, so people have taken that forward, and so that first methodology that I introduced was actually using individual level data and to make those estimates uh, use an awful lot of compute time and um, methodologically was complex. Now we're able to take the summary statistics from genome-wide association studies and get very similar estimates, and those can be done really in a, in, in a fraction of a second, really. So now people have looked between uh, genome-wide association study data sets of all disorders to estimate these genetic correlations between disorders. And I think if you look at that in, were to look at that in detail you'd see that, oh, you know, it makes sense that there's these relationships between disorders. Um, 
And in this, this paper, which I'm highlighting, which was published in Science in 2018, they also looked at the genetic correlations between neurological disorders and found relationships between those, and then genetic correlations between neurological disorders and the psychiatric disorders, and found that those genetic correlations between those two groups was actually far fewer, as you might expect, except perhaps between migraine and, and depression. And on the bottom right-hand side is an overlap of... Um, disorders from a graph I remember Neil Craddock presenting in 2009, which was based on his feel about how the disorders would be genetically related, but at that point there wasn't the empirical data to support that. And that's what we now have. Um, so in this um, Nature Genetics Review paper, um, we were reviewing the methods to estimate genetic correlations and how to interpret them. And you realise that... Uh, when we estimate a, a genetic correlation from these data sets, is it actually reflecting uh, biology, which is the way I was interpreting it when we estimate a genetic correlation between schizophrenia and, and bipolar disorder? But for some traits, maybe um, if you estimate a genetic correlation, it could um, reflect other causal mechanisms. So now people use this term horizontal pleiotropy, which I see as being genetic. You have a genetic factor that affects two different traits or a genetic factor which affects a pathway and that pathway affects two different traits. Or vertical pleiotropy, which is more about environmental causal relationships. So, for example, you could do a genetic study to look at um, genetic factors associated with lung cancer and you may well identify genetic factors associating with, with smoking because smoking is a causal for uh, lung cancer. Uh, and so in an, an analysis, you might pick up, as I say, it looks like it's a, a genetic association between, uh, with, with lung cancer, but it's reflecting that there's a causal pathway on the way to, on the way to that. Uh, and similarly, you may, if you did a... Yeah. So... Um, so that pathway forward was thinking about epidemiology. Now we can think about um, causal relationships. So I'm going to illustrate that with um, the relationship between psychiatric disorders and vitamin D. So my close colleague and friend back at the University of Queensland is John McGrath. John has um, had a hypothesis for many years. He's got this paper 20 years on, his hypothesis about the relationship between vitamin D and schizophrenia. And as an observational epidemiologist, he's found many different observations which are consistent with perhaps uh, neonatal vitamins, vitamin D status. Well, just any vitamin D status can be um, uh, is causally associated with schizophrenia. And so he worked closely with um, the Danish registry uh, researchers. In fact, he had a, held a Niels Bohr fellowship in, in Denmark. And so he was able to... Uh, go to Danish data and identify 424 cases of schizophrenia and he matched them with the next baby born along in the hospital, 424 controls. So these are people who had got schizophrenia in their 20s or 30s but he could go back to their blood spot when they were born because in Denmark they retained those blood spots. And so he went to the blood spots, identified the set of cases and controls and measured vitamin D and showed that those who later went on to get schizophrenia, had lower levels of vitamin D in their neonatal blood spot. That seemed too good, too good to be true, so he went and got a bigger sample, another 1,300 cases and 1,300 controls, and he uh, ob observed the same thing, which seems to be the best observational data which could infer this causal relationship. If you've got this low vitamin D at birth, maybe there's some neurodevelopmental impact that low vitamin D has on brain development. And so, having got this observational data, John was really keen to you know, use genetics to test this hypothesis. And so we used this method, Mendelian randomization, to allow us to test for causality. And so, with the UK Biobank, they uh, measured vitamin D in uh, their participants. And so, as soon as the uh, data were released, he asked me to collaborate with him, work led by Joanna Reve, a postdoc, to actually do the analysis of vitamin D in uh, the UK Biobank in order to test this causal hypothesis. So the concept of Mendelian randomization is to say, if I've got DNA variants associated with vitamin D, so variants which make vitamin D levels high or, or low, 
then if there's a causal association with a psychiatric disorder, anything that makes vitamin D levels high would be protective for schizophrenia and anything that makes vitamin D le levels low would be a risk factor for schizophrenia. And if there's a causal relationship, things which uh, big effects for vitamin D would have big effects for schizophrenia. And so that's the gist behind Bendelian randomization. And when we did this uh, with vitamin D as our exposure trait and saying these are our outcome traits, we found that there was no evidence of vitamin D having a causal relationship with these psychiatric disorders. A bit of a hint for Parkinson's, but that's not this theme. And so then in Mandela and randomization studies, you also want to look at the reverse causality. Um, because if, yeah. And so that's what we did here, where we took the genome-wide association study um, results for all these different traits. So here you're taking the SNPs, which are significantly associated with the psychiatric disorders, and then using them to say, are they correlated? Is there any evidence of correlation with effect size in our genome-wide association study for vitamin D? And here we found a lot of significant associations, particularly for educational attainment, but um, all of those associations in red are, are significant. So what does that mean? So what it means to me, I think, is that uh, this, these results could be consistent with John's observations, that if you have a mother who has a high genetic liability to schizophrenia, she first of all passes on that higher genetic risk to her children. And if you have a high genetic liability to schizophrenia, maybe you have an indoor lifestyle more. So that means you have less vitamin D uh, in your own blood, and so you'd be passing lower vitamin D levels into your, your child when they're born. And so these two observations of a low level of vitamin D uh, in neonatal blood would then be associated with a higher risk of schizophrenia later on in life. And so to me, these results, and I've seen results of many Mendelian randomization studies, and to me this is one of the most convincing because it's very significantly strong in one direction and not in the other direction, and both of those directions are very high-powered studies. And so to me this is very strong evidence that there isn't a causal relationship between vitamin D and schizophrenia. Um, interestingly, in the UK Biobank, you can do all sorts of um, analyses, and so to explain that negative correlation between vitamin D and educational attainment, you can actually do a genetic correlation between hours spent at the comp computer and vitamin D, and that's very strongly negative. So people with high education attainment have these terrible indoor jobs on the computer and don't have enough vitamin D. But I think these results are really important because if you actually go to clinical trials online, here you can't read it, but that's just showing that so if you just put in a, a search for uh, schizophrenia and vitamin D. There's really hundreds of trials around the world going on between vitamin D and schizophrenia, using vitamin D as a, a supplement. Um, and uh, in fact, John McGrath led one of these clinical trials, which was also published in 2022. It was a, actually a UK-based clinical trial, and it actually you know, showed no evidence that giving vitamin D uh, had any impact on, on outcome of, of symptoms in schizophrenia. And think how much money can be saved using these Mendelian randomization type methods to, you know, clinical it costs a lot of money to do a clinical trial. We have to use our patients carefully. Mendelian randomization is a good way to uh, help prioritize which cl clinical trials we should and shouldn't do, I think. Okay, um, another way, pathway forward, is um, using another way to use Mendelian randomization, which is a causality methodology is about looking, uh, linking results to, to drugs. So this example is led by my colleague in uh, Queensland, Sonia Shah, who, whose interest is cardiometabolic disease. And so she looked at ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors are used for hypertension. Loads and loads of people are using uh, ACE inhibitors to uh, reduce blood pressure. And there's been a literature suggesting there may be some relationship between antihypertensives and, and psychiatric disorders. And so she, in this Mendelian randomization study, she um, identified all the different drugs which reduce um, hypertension. She found uh, the drug targets, so the genes that are the targets of those drugs. She found SNPs which are associated with a variation in those genes. She tested that those SNPs were also associated with low blood pressure. So demonstrating that um, 
she had a, a genetic variant which uh, changed the expression of the gene but also had an impact on, on blood pressure. And then she checked the association of those risk variants with schizophrenia. So she tested that, tested that for many antihypertensive drugs. And out of those she tested, those ACE inhibitors showed that um, the SNP that reduces ACE expression, so would reduce blood pressure, would uh, increase, increases the risk of schizophrenia. So what does that mean? It means that if someone has schizophrenia and needs to have antihypertensives, as a lot of people do, that out of all the antihypertensives on the, on the market, you shouldn't choose an ACE inhibitor. And so then there's another p paper published here, which is actually from my now colleague in Oxford, Paul Harrison, who is able, has access to this massive medical database from the US. And in a totally independent study, was looking also at the recurrence of psychiatric disorders associated with antihypertensive drugs. And I think provides you know, triangulated evidence to, uh, which concurs with that, that ACE inhibitors shouldn't be used in schizophrenia. So again, this is a way we can take forward the results from schizophrenia in, in um, different settings. Um, so another way forward is in risk prediction. And uh, Varun made a very nice introduction about my role in um, risk prediction methodology. And so this is now winding back the clock to before some of the other studies I've already presented. So this is going back to 2006. And in the genetics world, human genetics, everyone was very excited about the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium study, which was essentially the first genome-wide association studies that were being conducted on a big scale. And so that, that study was set up with 3,000 controls and then 2,000 people of um, different, seven different disorders. And so as I say, the people, people in the field were like really excited. This is the biggest data set we've ever had. This is really going to show amazing results. But because I and my colleagues here, Peter Vischer and Mike Goddard, we come from actually this background in livestock genetics. And livestock genetics has clearly demonstrated that traits are polygenic. And when you've got your head in polygenic space, it seemed like how can we really identify DNA variants associated with these dise diseases and disorders with 2,000 cases and 3,000 controls? And we said, actually, these disorders are much more likely to be highly polygenic so one outcome of genome-wide association studies could be in risk prediction. And so it's back in 2007 that before there were any data available, we conducted a simulation study to look at the use of genome-wide association studies in risk prediction. And this is the concluding statement from that paper in 2007. The value from predicting individual disease risk from multiple associated variants could be reaped long before the causal mechanism of each is determined. And at that point, this was so out of the way people were thinking, this paper was submitted to the American Journal of Human Genetics and was rejected. It was published in Genome Research. But I think um, anyone in the field would realise that probably that statement is, is, uh, has got some validity. And so our future health is now being set up to look at polygenic risk prediction in, in um, the UK population. So in terms of polygenic risk scoring, as soon as we got a data set which we could apply it to, which for us was this um, working with the International Schizophrenia Consortium, we tried this concept of polygenic risk scoring in psychiatry. So I think that's interesting that the first application was in psychiatry. And so here we're taking results from genome-wide association studies. You identify the SNPs are most associated. You then uh, go to a totally independent set data set and count up the risk value alleles, a bit like I showed you uh, in, in that UK biobank study. So a polygenic risk score is a bit more complicated than just counting the number of risk alleles. You actually do a weighted count and you know, there's many, many methods now to optimise the selection of the DNA variants and optimise the weights. But essentially, you're just doing a weighted count of, of risk alleles. And then you're looking to see in this independent sample, is there a difference in the, that uh, score between cases and controls? And so that's what we did in this first study. Don't get too confused by all the green bars. But we had discovery samples from schizophrenia predicted into independent schizophrenia data sets. We took the discovery sample of schizophrenia predicted into bipolar data sets. And we also um, took the risk discovery sample of schizophrenia and predicted into the, in fact, the Wellcome Trust uh, data sets which had become available. And there you can see that we uh, had... Uh, the variance explained is small, but the significance is very high. 
showing uh, beta, better, higher prediction into schizophrenia than to bipolar disorder. So that was the first evidence of that genetic link with bipolar disorder, which we later formalized. And importantly, bipolar disorder is one of the Wellcome Trust data sets. And so the fact that we saw the signal for bipolar disorder against the same control set and not the other disorders was really convincing the field that this was um, something important. So, yeah, I work, I've worked in the field of polygenic risk scores. My team work on polygenic risk score methodology. And I suppose I'm also involved in trying to communicate polygenic risk score information um, to the broader community. So this is a, uh, one, the first of two papers published in JAMA Psychiatry. The first is a, a basic primer about po polygenic score risk methodology. It's kind of written, hopefully, for a... a, a, a a general audience to understand. I wrote it together with Peter Vischer, who, of course, is my collaborator on methodology. Um, this is when Graham was based in our group uh, for a sabbatical, and so he was part of that. So we had Graham, Ian, and John bringing in um, yeah, clinical expertise, and Janine is a, a genetic counsellor, and Tian Lin's my research assistant. So the question that we were asking is when should we use polygenic risk scores? And the first place that you can use polygenic risk scores is in a community setting. So for disease, it's a, what you already do screening for, for example, uh, breast cancer or heart disease. We already have screening programs where we have risk predictors which are based on things that you can measure. Add in polygenic risk score to that risk predictor to make a better predictor in a screening setting. Um, and so, for example... Uh, here we have the example of heart disease, where on the y-axis you can see many of the risk factors that we, we would happily associate with uh, heart disease, smoking, diabetes, family history, BMI, hypertension, high cholesterol. And you can see all of those risk factors have uh, lower C-index values than polygenic risk scores. So a C-index value can just be interpreted as the probability that, that a case would rank higher than the control on the, on the measurement. But uh, in our risk predictors, we combine all those uh, risk factors. And so the second from bottom uh, is the predictor from those combined risk predictors. So those are the risk predictors which are used in our uh, online predictors that, that are, uh, are commonly used at the moment. And then the bottom line is to say, what would you gain if you added a polygenic risk prediction? So you gain a small amount, but you gain something. And so... If you're doing a risk prediction program, why wouldn't you add in the polygenic risk scores to make your uh, prediction more accurate? Particularly because it's not very expensive to generate the genome-wide genetic data and make the, the risk predictor. And with genetic information, if you have it in your health record, you could make risk predictors for many diseases and disorders. So people in the... Um, so just to reiterate that a polygenic risk predictor is a risk predictor. It's not an absolute diagnostic predictor. So one of the problems in the field is people are used to genetic tests, which are genetic tests. So if you have a genetic test for cystic fibrosis, you've got one variant, and you're very highly likely to get it. If you have a genetic test for Huntington's disease, that's associated with a single variant, you get the disease. And so in the field, there's a, a mismatch between people's expectation. When you say it's a genetic uh, test... They think it's diagnostic, whereas it's just a risk predictor, just like many other risk predictors, it's essentially a biomarker. So a polygenic risk score is a biomarker. It just pr pr provides a strong foundation to add other biomarkers, other risk predictors into a risk predictor um, uh, formula. And in coronary artery disease, people are getting very excited about uh, polygenic risk scores and how it could add value, and it's really taking those results forward. Uh, but the risk predictor for coronary artery disease is actually much poorer than for schizophrenia. So there's only a 12-fold difference in risk between the top and bottom 1% of people on polygenic risk scores for cardio coronary artery disease. But for schizophrenia, there's actually a 38-fold difference between those who have the lowest 1% uh, percentile of risk compared to the top 1%. So, but that doesn't mean to say I think we should be using risk prediction in um, community mm -hmm. settings because the reason to put it into screening programs is that we, we know what to do with the results. I think putting a risk prediction into a community setting for psychiatric disorders has, has issues on many levels. And so our second paper, Could Polygenic Risk Scores Be Useful in Psychiatry? We said where we think polygenic risk scores would be useful is in the help-seeking community. So we know that young people often present at um, mental health clinics 
uh, in, in adolescence with, you know, um, in the, that prodromal phase where it's very hard to know which trajectory they're going on. And a clinician has to use all their skill in kind of evaluating the person as a whole as to what, you know, treatment route is best for them. And so if at that point you, you saw, oh, actually this person's got a really, really high score, for polygenic risk score for schizophrenia, I think that information could help that clinician at that stage to make um, uh, clinical decisions. So people are evaluating polygenic risk scores in clinical settings. So this was a paper published, uh, I can't remember, 2021, I think. So it's not using the latest genetic risk predictor. It only had 238 participants, but these were people with... This was a, a trial where people already had high risk for psychosis based on those standard clinical high-risk criteria. And then this was months from baseline, uh, dividing people by their polygenic risk score. And you can see those um, in the top 10%, uh, their probability of re remaining psychosis-free uh, was, was much lower than those with the, the higher polygenic risk scores. So I think this is showing that the you know, polygenic risk scores could be useful in psychiatry and in this case, this group already had a, a, a psychosis risk calculator, which included all these things and uh, concluded that including the polygenic risk score into this calculator would be useful. So that's kind of where the field is at the moment. Um, and I think essentially we just need more um, evaluations. And to be honest, I think polygenic risk score prediction needs to get more accepted in the community for other traits before we use it too much in, in psychiatry just because of a whole history of genetics in psychiatry. Just one slide here to say that polygenic risk scores combine with monogenic risk. So this is best uh, illustrated with other diseases and disorders. So here looking at coronary artery disease, breast cancer and colorectal cancer. So these are disorders where a small number of people carry variants which have very large effects. So let's focus on the middle one, where, which is the BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations associated with breast cancer. Think of Angelina Jolie, people doing double mastectomies when they find they, ha they carry this uh, uh, rare, rare variant. So you see whole families where they have high risk of breast cancer. So the difference in, in the lines is, is um, uh, the black line is showing... Uh, is. So the x-axis is percentile of polygenic risk score. The y-axis is the probability of um, breast cancer by age 75. You can see with the black line, those with a high polygenic risk have got uh, increased risk and that very non-additive relationship. It's exactly what uh, theory would predict. Um, and then polygenic risk, high polygenic risk score in the background of this high, um, high uh, uh, effect variant, so the blue line, shows that poly, you know, high polygenic risk in the context of this BRCA variant really increases your probability uh, massively. And so that's the same with all of these. Uh, high polygenic risk in the context of, of a, a rare variant of large effect uh, increases, uh, massively increases the risk. And, and similarly, low polygenic risk when you've got one of these uh, variants of large effect uh, dampens their risk. And so people are trying this sort of thing in psychiatry, for example... Uh, polygenic risk score for schizophrenia in the background of carrying a 22Q11 uh, deletion, but our data sets aren't, aren't really big enough at the moment. So I'm now going to think about another way of thinking about polygenicity, uh, because I think, um, I think it's hard to really understand the results from uh, genome-wide association studies for psychiatric disorders without having a really good feel for polygenicity. Um, and so we don't really think about variation within families. So this is a, a picture I picked off of the web. It's a Utah family, the mum and dad in the middle. Uh, these are their children. There's a couple of the children have got uh, a, a child. But you can immediately see that this is a family. They're, they're related to each other. But there's also variation. And one of the under, most underappreciated uh, things, I think, is it, it's actually taught in like Quantitative Genetics 101, that if you think about the genetic variation in the population, under a polygenic trait, half of the variation actually occurs within families. That you have two parents, uh, and they generate masses of variation in their children through the segregation process. So I'm going to illustrate that, if that's not clear. So going back to this um, slide where I showed these polygenic scores, and this was based on real data, and these polygenic profiles for individuals. So in the next slide, I've kind of made a toy example. And in my toy example, it's, um, it's a 30 by 30 square. 
And so I've got 900 variants which are associated with risk of a disease. And I've said that the risk variants have got a frequency of 1%. So that's, and that means that the frequency of the homozygote risk alleles is uh, you know, 1 in 100, which is why the red dots, which are the homozygous for the risk alleles, are, are, are not very common, and why the grey dots, which is homozygous for the non-risk alleles, are, are, are it's much more prominent. So in this toy example, if you just did the calculation, you'd see that there's, on average a person carries 180 risk alleles. And in this toy example, I'm going to say that someone who has disease is, is uh, there's higher risk if you carry 200 risk variants. So the question I'm asking here is, could two people without any family history uh, of a disorder have children who have, could their children have a high polygenic risk score? So now we're thinking about the segregation, the variation in children that they, can gener they generate. So at every one of these loci, um, we can think about the genotypes of the two parents and the genotype of, the, of their offspring. So if both the parents are homozygous for the non-risk allele, well, there's no variation. All the children are homozygous for the non-risk allele. Similarly, on the right-hand side, if both parents are homozygous for the risk allele, again, no variation in the children. But in all other combinations, there's variation in the children just by chance which alleles they receive from each parent. So if you take that through and think, well, let's allow that pair of parents to generate children, this is actually what you'd get in terms of variation. They're very prolific, this family. Um, this is, so the number at the top is the count of the risk alleles. So again, you know, all these, these profiles, you know, all unique combinations, but masses of variation in, in between the children. So in fact, um, in the population that you'd expect um, about the mean to go from 142 risk alleles to 218 in this toy example, and just the variation of the children in this toy example, 153 to 207. So masses of variation between children, and then you can see by chance one individual uh, in, uh, um, from this pair of parents has got a high uh, risk allele count. So this is showing how with, poly with a polygenic disease, two individuals who you know, aren't at risk themselves can by chance, you know, just the combination of variants that they happen to pass on to their children can end up with a high polygenic risk component for the, that child. And this is how all common diseases and disorders are working. They're all polygenic. Um, there's always this possibility of by chance. It's a bit like, you know, tossing heads. You know, it's very unusual to toss 100 heads, but by chance it could happen. So by chance, you know, it's a normal distribution, this count of risk alleles in the children, and by chance a child could end up with a, a high risk count. So that's just showing the variation, uh, graph of the variation within children. And so then we can ask the question, with, would people with a known family history have a high polygenic risk score? So here I'm taking, um, again it's a toy example, so the dad on the left hand side has got a high risk count, he's got 206 risk alleles, which in this toy example is very much putting him in the disease phase, whereas the mum, I've given her the average of the population. But again, they have children, their children, uh, the segregation variation. And so we can then look at these risk profiles for their children. And again, you can see that uh, there's masses of variation, that um, most of them have got black numbers, so they're not at high risk, even though their dad has got it, got, is at high risk himself. But there are many more risk, uh, many more red numbers. So you can look at the variation in there. Uh, the segregation variation in these children, the mean has shifted from the mean of the population, but still only a, a proportion of them are in this, this risk category for disease. So this is explaining polygenic variation with this toy example, but I hope you can see how that exactly fits with this graph I gave at the beginning, where there's a risk in the population and there's this higher risk in the children of those affected, and how it can be that you know, one of the things that I think people find conceptually hard is to convert these risk, um, relative risks to these heritability estimates. Um, but if you, if you work through thinking about this polygenic variation when a disease isn't very common, um, um, you'd have to, yeah, it, it makes sense. So this paper here is kind of a teaching paper published in Biological Psychiatry, I think in 2020, which is trying to get over these genetic concepts for a kind of a non-genetic audience.
So in summary, for polygenic risk scores, we know that polygenic risk scores are not diagnostic. They're simply risk scores. Polygenic risk scores can only be... They can't be diagnostic because they only capture the genetic contribution to risk. We know there is non-genetic risk. We know that they only capture part of the genetic risk because we've only identified part of the genetic risk. And then on top of that, the part of the genetic risk we've captured is estimated with error. So all those things mean that we know it's not diagnostic, but it still is a biomarker which had, could have predictive utility just as cholesterol is useful for coronary artery disease. So I don't know if you noticed the Royal College of Psychiatrists um, publication just last, uh, last month. This was a, a white paper, I guess, led by James Walters from Cardiff, and it's talking about uh, genetic testing in mental health settings. And one of their conclusions is that we shouldn't yet be using polygenic risk scores in clinical settings, but I think it is also suggesting we need to be doing research. But they are actually suggesting that in schizophrenia, so an adult onset disorder, that um, you know, some people presenting with schizophrenia should be uh, tested for variants of large effect. And I think why this is important, well, I think it's the first step along the way for getting a blood sample and getting DNA into clinical practice. And I think that's actually the information that we need to uh, propel research. So I would like to see uh, in you know, regular clinical practice a, a DNA sample becoming available so that we could in future be putting together genetic information with uh, data from clinical settings. Okay, uh, so other pathways forward are the way in which we can integrate our results from genome-wide association studies with other types of data sets. So here, it, this toy example, well, it's not a toy example, it's a real example, um, where we can take results from essentially genome-wide association studies that have been conducted on gene expression. So, for example, is what we call the GTEC study, where people have taken uh, tissue samples from you know, uh, dead people and... Uh, how do you say uh, so you've got gene expression from many uh, of genes from many different tissues so there's about 20,000 genes in the body so we've got gene expression of 20,000 genes from say 50 tissues and in fact these days you can actually think about gene expression in individual cells within a tissue so if those uh, in those data sets they also have genetic data so you can cut, conduct a genome wide association study for gene expression and then we can link it to our disease genome-wide association studies, again, linked by this uh, SNP backbone. Um, so, uh, so this was first done in 2015, and it was done with very broad tissue. So at the time, we were doing gene, gene expression in you know, bulk tissue. And so this was taking the results from genome-wide association studies, which is the header of each graph. And then it was co connecting them with the gene expression, genome-wide association studies for um, gene expression in these different uh, tissues. So this was a really good proof of pr principle that you can see for height, the tissue that was most relevant to the variants associated with height were to do with connective tissue or bone, that for Crohn's disease it was to do with immune, uh, immune tissues. Um, uh, what else? Uh, years of education to do with the brain, uh, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia to do with the brain. So on the one hand, you think, well, gee, you're telling me that um, <laughs> schizophrenia and, bi and bipolar disorder are traits of the brain. We know that. But it's a kind of proof of principle to show that the genetic variants are connecting to the tissue that makes sense. And so now, we've, um, as these um, gene expression data sets have gone forward, we are able to do more detailed um, connections. So now we have, um, and this is you know, very much emerging data, so these studies are going to become more and more uh, refined. But uh, here is an example of single cell gene expression sequencing from in my mouse, and also single nuclei sequencing from humans, connecting um, the results from genome-wide association studies to the genes which are more differentially expressed in different cell types, and then showing which cell types are likely linked to the risk factors for schizophrenia. So these were the graphs published in uh, the Nature paper last year, and the columns are showing use of different genome-wide association studies for schizophrenia, so basically showing the um, increase in power from the genome-wide association studies. We see more associations. 
And interestingly, we're seeing overlap in the results when you map them, connect them to the human cell types as to the mouse cell types. So it's really pointing to uh, excitatory pyramidal neurons. And as I say, this is work that's ongoing. So this, uh, this is a data set that was pu published um, just last year. So this is now taking human brain, single nuclear RNA sequencing. Uh, the, brain, the blue dots show different, um, different people who've provided uh, brain tissue. So this was using the prefrontal cortex, which, of course, is a tissue considered relevant for psychiatric disorders. Um, and the blue dots are showing the different people. So I think, I can't remember now, about 30 people over, over de developmental periods. And so this is just uh, taken from another talk. So my PhD student, Ang Lee, is working now at integrating results from genome-wide association studies for psychiatric disorders to this developmental trajectory um, gene expression data set. So over time, we're going to see more and more of these gene expression data sets, be more people filled in, um, and it will be you know, different uh, areas of the brain. So just one teaser of her results, which are ongoing. Here we looked at uh, different um, disorders of the brain, which are in the second part of the y-axis, with some control traits. So that was platelet clamp, male pattern baldness, hair color, height, bone mineral density, and then the brain-related traits, autism, ADHD, anorexia, schizophrenia, bipolar, mm -hmm. depression, insomnia, migraine, ADHD, ALS, Parkinson's, intelligence, and educational attainment. And so uh, I'm not showing the results where we've looked at the trajectories because I'm not yet confident of those results. But uh, again, with this interdependent data set, it's pointing to excitatory and inhibitory neurons, whereas the uh, control traits were more, for, more associated with glial and vascular cells. But a, a good uh, point of principle, Alzheimer's disease associated with micro, microglia, I think that's been identified from multiple studies. Uh, so I'm nearly coming to the end. So um, another way, for, why I think these results are important is because I can see the way in which the technologies for um, IPS, generating IPSC, so that's taking, you can take a blood cell, differentiate it into different neuronal types. If we know which um, cells are relevant to our disorders, then I think there's uh, opportunities for doing cell-based assays, um, hopefully linked to people who we know their clinical information. So that's thinking about individual cells. We can now have organ on a chip, which is growing multiple cells together, or even organoids. So this is all technology which is developing, but my view of that technology is it's becoming more and more scalable. It's going to be the future. We've got to get our clinical data sets lining up for when those technologies become available. And so I was part of a think tank last year where we uh, talked about designs which we thought were relevant for doing these, um, doing these cell-based assays, so thinking about high and low polygenic risk score high and low in both cases and controls. And for myself, um, I want to finish up because it's five minutes. So in Australia, we have this Australian Genetics of Depression study, which is very deeply phenotyped for 16,000 people with DNA. We've started to publish many papers. It's got many phenotypes. This is just showing all the modules of information. And we also have um, uh, prescription data. So this on the x-axis is prescription time, y-axis is, is people, the colours are different prescriptions. And what I've gone on to do is identify people who've got here more than 20 prescriptions of the same SSRI. So the study I'm currently launching in Australia is I'm going back to people, I'm trying to get 200 from each of these groups. So I've identified a group of people who've had 20 prescriptions of sertraline, Another two, I'm going to try and get another 200 people who've had um, citalopram or s -citalopram. Two other groups of SNRIs, a group where they've chopped and changed from their antidepressants and been told to have electroconvulsive therapy, which is like a non-responder group. A bipolar group, um, we can see that because they take lithium, but they've self-reported bipolar. And then a group who take antidepressants, but they're being augmented. So my goal is to collect 200 per group, I'm going back to them with a deeper questionnaire about their symptoms and I'm collecting PBMCs, blood for PBMCs, so that we can do cell-based assays on them. So in summary, I've tried to give you some ideas of pathways forward from genome-wide association studies. A lot of people would say, you've done these genome-wide association studies, you've got these variants of small effect, what, does, what can you do with it? Well, there's masses that we can do with it. It's just you've got to think, you know, think in a different way and make new experimental paradigms. So I've shown how we can take the results forward in epidemiology, in causality, in drug repositioning, in risk prediction, 
And I think the, the future for me will be um, cell types, the right, getting the right cell types for our disorders and doing cell-based assays which link to uh, clinical phenotyping. And so my, nothing happens without funding. And uh, so uh, here, thanks to many of the people who have contributed to the talk. Thank you. I realise it's nearly time, and I don't like taking more than an hour's people time, so if you need to leave, please feel free. <laughs> Thank you very much for a super exciting talk. Really oh. lots to think about. I guess we have time for questions, but all the people want to leave, please do. Uh, but we should open it up for questions. Thank you, that was amazing. Um, about the gene expression studies, I was curious about your thoughts on the fact that in case control differential expression studies, schizophrenia, say, the genes that seem to be differentially expressed have almost no overlap, as far as I can tell, with the genes linked to the variation in the GMOS studies. Does that mean both are is useless? Um, well, I know there's... You know, essentially, the, I, so you're talking about gene, ex, gene expression from brain for people with cases and controls. You know, th this is one of the problems then with gene expression is it's, you know, is it cause or consequence? So, you know, if you, if you compare, you know, cases and controls, schizophrenia, everybody smokes with schizophrenia. You know, those brains will have had, you know, years of drug treatment. So, to me, inherently, those data sets are problematic. They also may be too small. And to me, that's why I think the cell-based assays will be the way forward because that's then t saying how's the you know that will be directly going to the genome and saying how are those different genomes generating fe uh, you know phenotypes which converge on biology but there i know um, there's there's more data sets that are going to be generated and so maybe that will become clearer but um, yeah. <laughs> So say we identify 100 genes that we think have an effect, how can we move through the understanding of these genes and potentially identify you know, pathways that can be targeted? Um, well, I think it's fair to say that the drug companies are looking at these results carefully because there's been, you know, any drug development costs a lot of money and they've realised, you know, by looking at retrospective data, they realise that the ones that are more likely to come through their whole pipeline, have got genetic information at the beginning. So, obviously, it's a long story, but um, uh, so that information has already been used in that way. Um, you know, essentially, I think there's many ways to, to use it. It's just we have to... S we also have to think about new paradigms for doing that. So, do you think um, this could bring psychiatric research back to big pharma? I think it's already happening. I, I, that's the that's the the vibe I'm getting. Um, other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is a bit more generic. Um, so you talked a lot about schizophrenia, and I know uh, that that's the that is the disorder where the most of the genetic psychiatry mm. research is focusing. Uh, my interest is in obsessive compulsive disorder, and mm. my PhD is. Microscopically mm. uh, talking on that, what do we know about uh, OCD in this? Because also, I saw when you showed the zero, yeah, yeah, yeah the I, one I, I, was zero. Is I, I feel generally like there's so little attention on, on a disorder that leads one or other ten people to suicide, mm. and I think it should, much more attention should be paid to obsessive compulsive. Disorder. So I was just wondering, within your field... Well, I've got no doubt that there's a genetic contribution to OCD, and I've got no doubt that there's a strong polygenic component, because there's a strong polygenic component in everything. Um, but it's the data sets. So at the moment, there aren't big enough data sets. Mm. And so, you know, as you say, there isn't, it hasn't been the attention, so there haven't been clinical data sets with DNA. Mm. I think uh, people are putting more OCD-type questions into 
you know, population type studies. Yeah. Um, yeah, you just sort of lead the field in getting the data sets. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think there are strong genetic links between OCD and Tourette's. Yes. And um, also, yeah, another, sorry, another question. Um, uh, it was interesting when you showed the correlations across the different psychiatric disorders, because with autism, you show that there was very, a very, quite, quite little correlation compared to what we tend to see in the clinical practice, actually. Mm. So the, the, I mean, I didn't go into the detail of that plot, but obviously um, power comes into, yeah. into what is showing as significant. And so, you know, schiz the, as you said, the schizophrenia data set is the flagship. It has the strongest yeah. power. So you're more likely to see mm. correlations with schizophrenia and with other disorders coming up as being significant. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah. Uh, on the basic question of how far schizophrenia is the result of many common variants of small effects and how far <coughs> those genes. If you did a GWAS of retinitis pigmentosum, you'd probably, and I don't think anyone has. Oh, they have. Yes, I have. <laughs> They've done a GWAS of anything you can think of, but they've sure they Presumably, it, it looks like a conventional Manhattan. But in fact, almost all cases are major genes which were discovered quite easily mm -hmm. because inside the, the wonderful world of photoreceptors that have yeah. 50 molecules, 70 molecules that are unique to the, those cells. So ultimately, the SNPs are markers. And how, how do you know that they're not just the, the common SNPs are just not indicating in, in a subset of the population the presence of a major gene uh, mutation nearby. Um, I mean, you, you would expect in retinized pigmentosa to see SNPs near redoxin yeah, genes. Um, well, so let me give some examples which I'm more familiar with. So, for example, ALS. So, uh, motor neuron disease, there's a big C9 or, or 72 is in 7% of people with ALS. And so, that's a, a tan that's a repeat sequence which yeah. you don't pick up in genome-wide association mm -hmm. studies. So, yes, yeah. you do see a SNP association in that region, and the SNP isn't the variant, it's, you yeah. know, it's just yeah. a tag. Yeah. So, that could be going on. Um, but if it was just variance, var rare variants of large effect, we'd see different patterns in families. Um, and let me take another example of Huntington's disease. So we know that to have Huntington's disease, you have to have this um, increased repeat, CAG repeat in the Huntington's uh, gene. So the hunt, you know, we've known that gene for a long time. There's a, there's a consortium now which are, are using age of onset of Huntington's. So the length of the repeat is associated with the age of onset. And so they, they've used as their phenotype the difference between the age of onset predicted by that repeat and the actual age of onset. So that's been their phenotype. The deviation of your age of onset relative to the predicted one, use that in a genome-wide association study. And what that's identified is all these uh, polygenic variants which are associated, you're basically um, as associated with age of onset. You know, they're the, pre they're the risk factors which, polygenic risk factors which increase, uh, increase the severity of Huntington's by age of onset and, and decrease it. And so, again... Even in retinosa pigmentosa, there'll be these other variants which are you know, desperately trying to fight against this variant of large effect to try and put it back to a kind of bi more biological homeostasis. So, um, your question, you'll look at me like I'm not making sense. Um, no, 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 so, no, in, so, my other answer to that is, you know, because my background is in livestock genetics, so in yes. livestock, it's actually all about selection. So, that shows, you know, so the selection process shows you how traits are polygenic and you can develop the theory and show that it, it works. And so to me, it doesn't make sense that traits in, uh, in livestock or all the model species where you did those selection experiments um, would be different to humans. So, you know, polygenicity has to make sense because it's but biological robustness as well. Uh, yeah. Much of the findings, uh, almost all of the findings in genomic, well, functional genomics of the population level have been 
uh, basically are dependent on the genetic background. So basically, all the babies that from Caucasian backgrounds or African backgrounds or East Asian backgrounds, they are completely separated, and the results are not basically translatable across all those I, I, Well, so I would disagree with you there. I mean, the, the common variants are ancient in yeah. the population, uh, and uh, common variants are actually shared. So the co common causal variants are very likely to be shared across, po across populations. But what's different has been the population history. So that means the SIPs correlated with those causal variants uh, will, will differ. So one of the things with genome-wide association studies is that, you know, because of the correlation structure in the genome, we could have many SNPs which are correlated. And in our association study in Europeans, we might pick any one of those. And in another Africans, it might be only this much, which is... Correlated. So then it's very important that we've actually got the SNP that's, that's, that's causal in the... I'm not explaining it very well, but essentially the common variants are shared across ancestries. And you can see that um, risk predictors do for height do translate into other ancestries. And if height translates, others do. And we can see that with... There's many traits that have shown that. But essentially it's a big area of research, this transferability... But to me, it's about getting to the causal variants, that mostly the causal variants are going to be shared. There may be some population-specific ones which will be rarer or maybe because they're on something major environmentally different. But in general, the variants will be shared. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks for the talk. It's a good question. Uh, what do you think uh, cultural adaptation adds to protein storing methods? And um, secondly, how would you Well, that's a very good question, and thank you for the segue to advertise our new paper, which is coming out in Nature Genetics. <laughs> and so the group in Brisbane have developed a method called SBASE RC, and so that's adding um, functional annotation. So that's basically saying, in a polygenic risk score methodology, you know, what you're trying to do is say, you know, which SNPs do you select out and which weights to give them, and can you use the functional annotation to upweight some versus others? And what we find is that adding those annotations actually doesn't add very much at all. And maybe because the annotations need to be cell type specific, which is another route we're going down. But in that paper, we, um, we now use risk prediction from 7 million SNPs rather than just a million, which is what's used in many methods. And we find that combination of the annotations and using 7 million SNPs actually imp has improved risk prediction, you know, substantial is a relative term, but it's also particularly improved it in, in the transferability. So that's getting, again, to the point I was making here. It's about that is likely to have helped us get more to the causal variance. If you're, if you're weighting the causal variance more, then the prediction is going to be better in the other ancestries. But still, the, the prediction into the African ancestry is, is, is worse, and it will be because there's much more genetic variation. You stand up. <laughs> um, just a question about um, the polygenetic effects. So you're looking into the causal mechanism between uh, genotype and phenotype, I assume, uh, a bit, uh, or a lot. <laughs> um, and you were um, talking about that in schizophrenia that you can see that effect is la largely in the, in the central nervous system. You can see that mechanism is there, but is it then... Um, I don't know if there's any information about this, but do you also think that the effects in the central nervous system are also um, very varied, or do you think there might be more unitary uh, effects in the mechanism? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, traditionally people were tra taking genetic results and looking at those you know, individual genes, looking very carefully for mechanism. I am quite outspoken about saying that's not the way we need to be looking at mechanism because, you know, essentially, as someone said, it's about the background. You actually have to have many of these risk variants together, which converges on a biology which is obviously problematic, which, again, as I said before, is a signal of robustness, that you've got these risk variants and all these other mechanisms are trying to dampen down. You know, you've got a biological system, and particularly in the brain, it seems like the brain... Brain disorders are actually more pelagenic than other disorders, which I think is, again, saying that the brain needs to be more protected. So um, I wouldn't be looking at mechanisms for individual genes. I'm more interested in about how things converge. And I would imagine that it's going to be 
you know, something in neurodevelopment that the cells are set up in a way, maybe they grow subtly too fast or subtly the wrong shape. And having got that uh, risk, you know, that risk set up at birth, maybe, you know, got another set of risk variants which are coming in, which are saying, you know, the synapses aren't being pruned in the right way. So I think it's going to be very subtle levels of biology along the way. Um, and it will yeah, be happening at multiple time points in multiple cells. So you wouldn't expect something like vitamin D to be the answer? Um, I think, you know, the Mendela randomization is a statistical method, but I don't think, I think uh, vitamin D isn't pointing to causality in that way. But I do think that genetics will help us think about you know, one of, one of John's motivations for that vitamin D hypothesis was, you know, thinking about the folic acid st story for uh, spina bifida. You know, when I was a child, other children had spina bifida, and now they don't because folic acid has been put into to everyone's bread and things like that. So, you know, is there something that we could do which is preventative? And uh, I, I think we don't talk about that enough, enough in psychiatry. And I think, again, genetics might help lead us that way. That hasn't really answered your question. I just went off on my, one of my <laughs> rambles there, but... I think, uh, yeah, Mariel. I guess, does that mean you think that massively parallel reporter assays are going to be quite limited in what they can tell us about biology? Yeah, I, people are going to be doing that. They're doing CRISPR edits. Um, I'm more interested in taking the natural variation, which is why I like this high-low polygenic risk score design in people who are cases and people who aren't. And going, I think we should be going to cell-based assays and just trying to measure anything that we can. And it, it's not yet trying to get ca to causality. It's just trying to get to a set of measures which show something convergent between the ones who've got a high risk compared to ones that don't. And so I kind of feel like uh, we had the same paradigm for a long time with the common complex disorders. Everyone was focused on the genome-wide association studies. And I suppose I feel quite strongly that the pathways forward the other diseases and disorders, so like if you're working on diabetes, you know it's the pancreas, or if you're working on inflammatory bowel disease, you know it, they know so much already that they can go more quickly to the causal mechanisms, where I kind of feel like with the disorders of the brain, uh, the, we have to take a, a slower path, and just trying to find measures which associate with um, the ge genetics will be the intermediate step before we can do the causality thing. Mm. How much of that would be confounded by heterogeneity? Um, heterogeneity in the phenotype? Yeah, even at the cellular level, you know, with the hugely heterogeneous phenotype, which we know is the case of psychiatric mm. conditions, would they just sort of pull out sort of fairly generalizable mechanisms? So you won't get specificity, but you get some sort of sensitivity. Um, you know, so heterogeneity, in a sense, points to non additivity. And uh, People in psychiatry get very excited by machine learning, for example. And I think machine learning methods are great if you've got the right data. And so I actually think cell-based assays generating masses of phenotypes in a kind of uh, uniform way might generate the data for which machine learning could utilise those data and then may be more able to point, you know, point us to heterogeneity. I don't know. Time for a couple more questions. Um, Safar. Yes, thank you for this fine talk. Um, my question is about rare and common variants. Mm -hmm. um, is there currently evidence to say that these would converge into the same biological pathways uh, to end up into the same phenotype, even though they're very different genetic? Um, I think it's actually the opposite that you get the rare variants of large effect seem to be associated with many phenotypes. So to me, that's saying which diagnosis you get depends on the polygenic background that that rare variant has landed in. So you know, many people are focused on identifying those rare variants, and people are going to be following them up because they already have the tools for following those up. But I'm more interested in promoting saying, let's make the new experimental designs that focus on those common variants and then hopefully things will converge. Because I know the rare variant stuff will be going on, but, yeah, there's, uh, there are now groups around the world thinking about how to be doing the right, yeah, new experimental designs which think about polygenicity. Thank you.
in a laboratory setting. Graham, last one. Uh, are all common traits highly polygenic apart from Alzheimer's? Uh, Alzheimer's, that's an interesting one. Um, now, I don't know enough about Alzheimer's, I'm going to say. Um, I was having a discussion, yeah. I, I don't know what to believe on the data that, because you know, there's two things going on, I think. Obviously, there's, you know, ApoE is a very rare variant of large effect, and the trouble with Alzheimer's is, you know, age of, age of onset confounding things. Yeah, I haven't looked enough at the, the data, but I do know there's a bit of a debate going on in that field, which I'm not going to contribute to right now. Good. Great. Thank you again okay. very much. I'll end there. Uh, thanks. Thank you again okay. very much.